The history of the ancient Middle East is complex and um, covers a vast swath of time. From about 10,000 years ago, uh, people in this area began the agricultural revolution where they started to domesticate plants and animals and live in villages, um, tending their crops versus hunting and gathering like people did in the past. And this also began to develop a token system to record trade and accounts, which led to mathematics and to writing. So there's, of course, many innovations that came from this area. Um, the re for reasons really not well understood, the civilization of Southern Mesopotamia uh, underwent a sudden growth and change uh, centered around the cities of Ur and Uruk. And um, these areas is now, you know, it's what's in modern day Iraq. So it's called the Fertile Crescent because it's between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which creates a fertile zone uh, amongst a very rough and rugged uh, climate. And because of the life giving water of those two rivers, uh, civilization was able to thrive and then there were different civilizations that took center stage and dominated the region at different times as you can see by this short listing. Um, so let's dive into this further. You can see that the, the crescent is defined by um, the border near the Persian Gulf <clears throat> and notice Ur and Uruk down there near the Persian Gulf Originally, the coastline extended up to Ur, so it would have been right on the coastline. And then it extends up through now what is Syria and then over to the Mediterranean. And so, um, again, what's not quite clear is why people started to create more cities in this area from those smaller villages. Uh, they don't know if it was driven by climate change, which made agriculture less productive, but nonetheless, people started to gather into larger cities and new innovations such as the plow and the potter's wheel and even the introduction of bronze um, can be seen in this more intensive economic city life. So um, it started to increase, increase complexity in living and we'll see increased complexity in um, the type of building too because originally they just lived in very simple kind of reed woven houses and um, tended their sheep. And um, we'll start to see that they begin to build much larger structures in stone as well as mud brick. And um, we will take a look at those next. So during these centuries in Mesopotamia, uh, this was the rise of these first city states. And they also had gods that were associated with the nat with natural phenomenon. The land around this area is extremely hot and dry, and the Tigris and Euphrates are not the peaceful rivers like the Nile that are predictable. So they tended to have more um, dramatic uh, gods and goddesses who had a, a lot of system of duality. Like, so for instance, the same goddess could be the goddess of love and the goddess of war. Um, the king was also oftentimes the head of the religion as well. So there'd be like a priestly king um, and a powerful priesthood that was appealing to nature to help the people survive. Uh, so this includes areas such as the um, modern day Turkey, again, extending over to what's now modern day Iran and uh, into modern day Iraq. And um, we'll see that these cultures, then there was quite a bit of upheaval uh, they spent more time in battle and devoted more resources to weapons and warfare. But notice they also developed some very important systems in agriculture, such as using uh, digging ditches and using irrigation for crops. They developed the first written form called cune cuneiform. Um, and we already talked about urban centers, developed systems of mathematics. And they were the first to start to um, group time into units of 60, you know, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour and so forth. And um, ma modern mathematics has you know, er emerged from these early um, tenets that they established during this time. Also, the um, astronomy and astrology started to be developed more um, systematically and things 
uh, other innovations such as the wheel, the chariot, and the plow, which helps with um, you know, making more productive crops, all emerged during this time period in this area. Sumerians developed the first um, or the oldest full-fledged writing system that has been yet discovered, and it was based on units of 10. So originally it was a way to um, keep track of crops and record transactions for business. And these um, basically was a wet clay tablet and they would press a stylus into the clay to create these different um, pictorial references to keep track of, again, uh, crops, taxes, and so forth. Like I said, they were involved in using the number 60 as a concept of time because 60 was the number of one of their main goddesses. Um, so many things were based on units of 10 also, and um, everything was metaphorical and symbolic. So again, this is cuneiform, one of the first known writing in the world. This artifact, the disc of Eheduana, is depicting the world's first known poetess. Um, she was the daughter of the Emperor Sargon, who was one of the leaders around this time in Ur in Mesopotamia. And she was also a priestess uh, for Inanna, one of the major goddesses, and also a writer, astronomer. And um, he, she composed several works of literature, including 42 temple hymns and um, praising Inanna and other celestial deities. So uh, this is the, her position on this disc shows her importance because notice her head, the one with the crown on it, is breaking through the register and she's a little taller than the other figures. Um, so this is how the Sumerians showed someone who was of great importance. They had a very diverse religions, but from here rose the belief in a supreme god or mother goddess in some places that became the basis for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Um, religious leaders organized workforces and collected and distributed fruit, food and also directed construction of the temple. Um, but here we see the Mosque of Warka, who, and it's a depiction of one of their main goddesses, again the goddess Inanna, who is the goddess of love and fertility. Um, she is carved from marble and she's one of the first known depictions of a human face that's in proportion like this. Uh, so again, this shows the concept of duality because she's not only the goddess of love and wisdom, but she's the god of war and desire. Um, she's often depicted standing on the back of two lions and she's associated with the planet Venus. Um, later, she'll be called Ishtar, the goddess Ishtar. So what's fascinating about this artifact is that this artifact was stolen during the liberation of Baghdad um, from the um, Gulf War or the Iraq War and a tip from an Iraqi led to a young boy, just a six-year-old boy. Then the little boy led them to a smuggler um, that led them to a farm because this again was stolen from the museum in Baghdad. Um, so anyway, they were led to this farm on the outskirts of the city and this artifact was buried under six inches of dirt and wrapped up in rags and Fortunately, it was returned and recovered, uh, it was returned to the Iraqi National Museum because again, it's a, a precious artifact since it's one of the very first depictions of the, of the face um, from this area. Here we see one of the famous building forms of Mesopotamia, which is called a ziggurat. And ziggurat in Sumerian means temple of the foundation of heaven and earth. So the ziggurat is the mud brick platform that is elevating the temple above the rest of the city. Um, it was considered a dwelling place for the gods and only the priests and priestesses were allowed to attend um, and each city had their own patron god. So this one um, is for the city of Uruk and um, this white temple that you see again is not the ziggurat itself. The platform is the ziggurat. So Again, the type of construction we'll see here is mud load-bearing construction, which means the lower courses support the upper courses. Because of this desert climate, there's a big shortage of wood, um, and so this lent itself to long, narrow rooms around central courtyards in their building templates. Uh, but this is called the White Temple, and let's take a closer look at it on the next slide. 
This model of the White Temple shows what it must have looked like from 3500 BCE. Um, it, took, it was estimated it took about 1500 laborers 10 hours a day for about 15 years to build something of this size and scale. You can see the scale figure in there. There's a steep stairway leading, leading up the ziggurat to the temple and the side of the temple had these resets stripped or bands which create this feeling of uh, light and dark effects. The corners are oriented to north, south, east and west, the cardinal directions. And also the top of the ziggurat itself is layered in brick and bitumen, which is uh, basically asphalt for the foundation. So if you can imagine this is a mud hill, right? Mud brick hill. They had to put some kind of waterproof foundation down so it wouldn't erode away. It's called the White Temple because the walls are entirely whitewashed. Um, so usually they use a mixture of gypsum and it basically creates like a painting coat, uh, hence the name White Temple. So you can see that it's this long rectilinear hall uh, with rooms on either side. There would typically be a ritual fire on the altar and then there's a podium for the priest to you know, do ceremony. Um, also, they found deposits of leopard and lion bones in the foundation. So it was thought these animals were ritually buried, um, or at least their bones were, um, to give the architecture strength. And other types of ritual objects were found, you know, in the foundation as well. So it just also gives you a sense of um, their mindset in constructing a temple with those power lions or power animals as kind of the foundation piece. An ingenious decorating system that they developed was what's called cone mosaics. Uh, so this was used by forming small uh, clay cones. So if you kind of, let's say, picture an ice cream cone upside down, it would be in that shape made out of clay. And then these little cones are pressed into the wet plaster. So usually they're about four inches tall and they have the flat round circular side on the base of it. So that flat round surface presents uh, an area to paint either red, white, or sometimes, or in black, black, red, and white were the common color palettes. And sometimes you can see they were uh, creating patterns such as the zigzags, the chevrons that we saw in ancient Egypt, what's called the lozenge patterns, which are those diamond shapes. And these were thought to imitate the kind of patterns they were using on their woven reeds and mats that they use for floor covering in um, homes and other buildings. This is the work of vase from 3500 BCE, uh, discovered around Yurik also. It's three feet high and carved from alabaster and it weighs 600 pounds. It was discovered in 1934 and actually there's a pair of vases of this. So this is, gives us a chance to talk about, again, Mesopotamian art and the use of registers. So the registers are the decorative bands and notice the lowest register is showing uh, plants. So basically crops of grain and barley and reeds and so forth. The second register going up is livestock. So you can see the goats and sheep and cattle and things that they were um, domesticating. The third register up is showing people with offerings. And then the top register which is the largest, is the showing the goddess. Again, she has been depicted as the largest figure. And it also shows the king presenting the offering to the goddess. So this again shows how whatever um, person was depicted largest, and often again, their head would break through the band of pattern. That would be someone either of godly stature or kingly stature typically. Another famous ziggurat or temple mount is the ziggurat of Ur. Um, again, this is built by king, um, the king of Ur, Ur -Nam Namu, and it's 148 feet long, or 210 feet long, 148 feet wide, and 98 feet high. So it's about a 20th of the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza, but it's using 720,000 adobe or mud bricks, and this is another Temple Mount that um, would have held a shrine at the top for the moon goddess Inanna. Um, and this, she was one of the patron deities of Ur. Um, so the other thing that to note is that this has three layers of solid mass mud brick 
Originally, it would have been painted also. Unfortunately, this was damaged during the 1991 Gulf War. Um, about 400 bullet holes ended up being lodged in the side of the ziggurat. And um, it was also kind of shaken by many explosions near it. So um, again, but fortunately, it still stands pretty much intact today. We'll see these stepped pyramid shapes used in many cultures throughout the world, um, in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica and um, in Asia, and among other places. But um, the form of the ziggurat itself is also going to be used later when we look at the Art Deco period, and there's this um, interest in ancient Middle Eastern art, and these types of forms are used again during that time in the 1920s. So this is what it might have originally looked like with the temple on top and then the terraced um, landscaped uh, outdoor areas. An important artifact from Ur is this one, the Royal Standard of Ur, uh, that was found in a royal grave and it was thought to be from a king. Um, and this is, was, is basically a hollow wooden box that's about eight and a half inches wide, 19 and a half inches long. And it, you can see it has inlay of lapis lazuli, that's the dark blue color, along with um, shell inlay from shells along the Persian Gulf. And we also see some um, carnelian or the red stone from India and uh, the lapis would have come from Afghanistan. So this is a very important artifact because it shows that they had long distance trade going on from centuries ago. And um, you can see we saw the lapis largely being used in ancient Egypt as well. So that would have been imported from Afghanistan, which is now, it wasn't called that then, but that's the geographic area where lapis was found at this time. So the Royal Stand of Ur is also significant because it shows that concept of duality. On one side of the standard is, is a depiction of war, which you see here with the chariots and the soldiers. And on the other side, it's depicting a banquet and peace. So this is shaped like a Toblerone box, if you're familiar with Toblerone chocolate. So kind of a triangular shape. When we say a standard, it was thought to have maybe been originally put up on a pole. Um, so a standard, if you've ever heard that term standard bearer, is usually some kind of a flag or insignia that's carried aloft on a pole when an army is um, marching into war and this is kind of showing the, their colors. And so again, this was a ceremonial standard uh, buried with a king. If you'll recall from the last lecture, the Egyptians and how they used carved ivory uh, to depict animal legs, such as bull legs, on their furniture. And you can also see that in Mesopotamia, uh, people of power would have animal-shaped legs on their furniture. So you can see the king, again, notice his head is he's on the top row, and his head is breaking through the register of pattern. And then he's also just sitting on a throne with animal-shaped legs. Uh, so again, also indicating uh, his importance and his uh, higher position. As I mentioned, it's a significant artifact because it shows that they had extensive trading. Uh, they were importing copper from India, silver from what's now modern day Turkey and Syria, gold from the Asian mountains, uh, lapis lazuli, the blue again from the area which is now known as Afghanistan. And they were trading crops, crafts, and textiles. So they were, they were doing a lot of um, sheep herding. So wool was a major export and um, woven wool at that. So this is still an area in the Middle East that's known for its beautiful textile arts and ex especially rugs. Um, and so this started, you know, from all of these centuries ago. This male artifact that you see with the long beard is an interesting concept because it's called a standing male worshiper. It's basically carved from alabaster and the eyes are made from shell and black limestone. It's about a foot tall, but what these were was that an elite member of the community would uh, hire an artisan to carve that, a likeness of them. And they were then placed before the altar of the God and the goddess. So that, that for that person could be seen to be worshiping the patron deity of that city. 
24 seven basically. Um, and so a lot of times the, um, they'll stand before the statue of the god or goddess and then they're embodied, their, their energy is embodied in that sculpture. So again, that they get credit for um, worshiping at the deity uh, when they can't be there in person. <laughs> One thing you should know for the class is you don't have to memorize any dates. Um, we're just talking about general time periods that you should know, but uh, specific dates are not required. But what we do want to know is that um, the supremacy of the Sumerians was interrupted in about 2340 BC by the Akkadians and that dynasty again founded by King Sargon. And they, their dynasty ruled a large uh, swath of territory stretching from the Persian Gulf over to the Mediterranean. But they were, after they declined, after about two centuries, then that gave rise to the Babylonians. And um, the Babylonians used the city of Babylon as their main center in, within Mesopotamia. And the Babylonian king Hammurabi became the chief power. And um, so this is going fast forwarding to about 1792 BCE. And the Hammurabi conquered the Sumerians and um, commanded a unified state, which is now in northern Syria. So you might have heard of the Code of Hammurabi, which is this idea of karma, uh, meaning this, uh, like they had the idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, that if you were to put out someone's eye, then your eye would be put out, for example. This is called the Golden Age of Mesopotamia, and this Code of Hammurabi had um, was in a law to help individuals conform to group standards and um, this idea something we're still grappling with today right um, this is also where the first epic poem the epic of Gil Gilgamesh emerged during this time period the capital of or city of Babylon is about 50 miles south of what's now modern day Baghdad and uh, we'll take some looks at some of the interesting um, architectural elements of that city. But what you want to know here is the wealth of Babylonia of tempted invaders from many directions. And so, again, this was not a peaceful coexistence. There was a lot of warfare going on uh, during this time and many rivals, you know, vying for power. So if you look at the way that the Babylonians are building, you can see evidence of that. So notice the um, draw, the bridge leading up to the, the gate to the, the city. And um, think to yourself, why do they have this narrow entranceway into the temple? Um, why is the temple fortified with towers and walls? Um, and then you can see again the levels of restriction going from more open um, plazas and courtyards and then getting um, more as they go you move further back toward the temple again going into more restricted areas this is some a concept we also saw with the egyptians in the temple of karnak under um, hammurabi they were working on controlling resources by improving irrigation and controlling the water um, so you can see that here with these um, canals and so forth and you'll see that when a society controls the water, um, they control power, right? Because water is life. They also set up systems for collecting taxes and using these walls around the city <clears throat> to in prevent invasion. Um, and then they did fall, and then they had what's called the Neo-Babylonian Empire under King Nebuchadnezzar II, which we'll talk about next. But um, this is a artistic depiction of what it might have looked like um, during the Babylonian heyday. So that's showing the Tower of Babel um, behind there, again, artistically depicted. This was a story from the Old Testament. And as a matter of fact, Alexander the Great ordered the Tower of Babel demolished in 331 BCE, and they were going to reconstruct it. Uh, but this never occurred due to Alexander the Great's death. So now it just exists in stories and legend. Another important structure, that's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, is this one, the Ziggurat at Shoga Zanbil. 
Um, and this is under the Elamite uh, kingdom. So uh, Dur Untash was this, or the city of Untash, uh, again, is in modern day Iran near the Persian Gulf. And this one was built to honor um, one of their great gods. And this is significant in architecture because it's the first known use of glazed bricks. Um, taking terracotta then and adding um, external glazing to it so that it becomes more waterproof instead of being exposed to the weather. This also has showing statues of bulls, griffins at the entrances. It's also threatened by oil ex exploration because they're doing seismic blasting in the Persian Gulf about 900 feet away from the structure and it's feared that it's going to destabilize the structure. Um, it was destroyed partially by the Assyrians in 650 BC um, the other unique feature about this particular ziggurat is it has an internal staircase, uh, five stories tall, and this was hoped to um, suppress any attacks by the Assyrians. So again, another example of a defensive uh, style of architecture. The cultures of this time period in Mesopotamia and going over to Egypt, and then when we look in the Mediterranean cultures of the Minoans, for example, all used uh, composite deities um, and beings to depict certain um, spiritual attributes. And so we, here we see a winged goat, and this is from the famed um, Babylonian way and go, leading up to the Ishtar Gate. And this was built under the Neo-Babylonian Empire under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II in about 575 BCE. It was considered one of the great wonders of the ancient world. And let's take a look at it from our next slide. So this is an artistic depiction of what the original processional way would have looked like. Um, and again, this is uh, called the Ishtar Gate. So this processional way is leading up to that big blue gateway in the back, which was a large cedar gate uh, adorned with bronze. This processional way went about a half a mile long. And um, you can see then they're controlling who can enter the city by funneling everybody into this narrow passageway. And then notice the crenellations up on the towers. So that's, that's that sawtooth pattern at the top. And so think to yourself, what um, are those good for other than decoration? Uh, if you've ever seen movies with knights and castles and archers, uh, you might have a clue about how the archers can hide behind those um, vertical uprights and then shoot arrows through the the V slots um, and stay protected from return fire. So this again was an example of defensive architecture, but it's also quite lovely in the use of glazed brick. Uh, this was one of the largest projects using that glazed brick and the colors range from yellows, browns, and blues. Uh, these walls are about 50 feet tall and it's been reconstructed partially in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. So let's take a look at that. So if you're lucky enough to have visited Berlin, some of you might have seen this. Um, again, this is the reconstruction of the Ishtar Gate. And um, notice the beautiful deep blue glazed bricks and depicting the Persian lions. Now, there was actually a, a subspecies of lion that lived in this area. Um, so we'll talk about that more in a minute. As you saw, the glazed bricks are depicting fantastical creatures such as dragons, um, but also um, animals that would live in the area such as lions and bulls. But notice these stylized palm trees and those kinds of um, spirals that are depicting the fronds of the palm. That's going to be a significant detail that's going to lead to what's called an ionic uh, volute on a capital when we look at Greek design. So we're going to see this kind of stylized palm tree motif used not only in the Neo-Babylonian Empire, but in um, the Phoenicians building style and um, into classical Greece. So this uh, large complex was about 2,100 acres and these streets ran at right angles to each other. The, again, the profession, processional way led to the heart of the city and um, these, there were royal palaces in Babylon, including the Summer Palace and the Northern Palace. And the last, um, the Southern Palace consisted of over 200 rooms. So that just gives you a bit of a, a feeling of how um, wealthy 
this civilization was. There was also the um, mythical hanging gardens of Babylon. So this, these gardens were written about, uh, but there's no remnant of them has ever been found. Um, so they thought it might pertain to the city itself because they had these different terraced levels and they planted um, different plants on different levels by pumping water up from the river again. So it shows that they can control the water. It was said those were built for the Queen Amatis because she was from Syria, which is a much more lush uh, environment with has forests and so forth. And she was living here in Babylon in the heart of the desert. And so it was said that um, Hammurabi built the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Or sorry, it was Nebuchadnezzar, I think, was meant to have built them for her uh, so that she would not be homesick. So when we look at these Persian lions um, that are proceeding down to the gates of Ishtar, this is actually a subspecies of lion that is found or used to be found from the Mediterranean all the way to the Gear Forest in India. Um, and they're smaller than an African lion with a smaller mane, but um, they still also represented majesty, kingship, courage, and power. Uh, like I said, they were also a symbol of the goddess Ishtar. So she was often depicted riding on the back of two lions standing on their backs. So this subspecies of lion is still found in uh, West India. And um, they are also notable because two Persian lions were presented to the Chinese emperor. And that led to some new um, motifs in China um, that we'll talk about when we get there in class four. Okay, so this map is showing the rise of the Assyrians. If you look over near where it says Assyria and just below that word, you'll see Ashur. Um, this was the first large um, capital for the Syrians or the Assyrians. Then it was, uh, their capital was at Nimrud and then finally Nineveh. And um, they were under the rule of Sargon II. So we'll see some artwork depicting him. In the fifth year of his reign, uh, he built a great palace for himself at Dur Shakun, which is, um, again, we're going to see some evidence of on the next few slides. So one other thing to note with this uh, Neo or the Assyrian Empire, they had very important um, commerce in ironworks. So they were known weapon makers, and that was one of the things that they exported um, as a trade item. And this area in Syria, they still are known for beautiful metalwork. In the fifth year of his reign, Sargon II uh, built this fortress and palace called Deir Sharkin. Uh, it was massive with seven gates that have these protector deities called Lamasu. Do you see those large uh, statues? And this was also, as you can see, brightly painted frescoes adorn the walls, um, like we saw in the Egyptian time period as well. And these, um, this is near modern day Korsaba, if you're wondering what area of the world this is. So this uh, straddled the city wall on a raised terrace and um, these royal apartments and reception rooms were decorated, as you can see, very with or very ornamental wall paintings. And you can see the um, skylight that's in use also to illuminate the um, interior of the palace. OK, here are the Lama Sioux. Um, they are showing the body of a bull, the head of a person and swiftness or the wings of a, an eagle. So it's meant to show the strength of a bull, the swiftness of a bird, and the intelligence of a human. And all these powers are harnessed to protect the royal Assyrian palaces from evil forces. So um, notice this really interesting uh, detail that they have five legs. That way, if you're looking at the statue from the front, you see four legs. And from the side, the, one of the front legs is hidden behind the other, so you still see four legs. They also have these very fanciful details, like notice the horns of the bull wrap around the human's head, and the human has um, bull-shaped ears with earrings. <laughs> so, um, and then these long ornamental 
beards. So these were um, ones that, again, were iconic to the Assyrians. And they were taken, um, tried, you know, there's some of these artifacts are found now in Europe. Um, many artifacts were lost in 1853. There was a ship that was heading to the UK with these artifacts, and it was scuttled by pirates. Um, another 200 crates of artifacts was lost in a river. So perhaps they just don't want to leave um, the Middle East. On this one, you can see what I was talking about, about the five legs. So if you can picture standing straight to the side, notice that one front leg would be hidden behind the other one. And so you would see four legs from the side. And then if you're standing facing the front of the statue, you see four legs again where that um, back leg or the, the leg right behind the left front leg is hidden. So they wanted it to look balanced from either viewpoint. You can also see the Lama Sioux being used here at the Nineveh Gate um, from the city of Nineveh, which was one of the large cities in the Assyrian Empire. And um, the Assyrians were known for uh, many things. This, they sp spread out from the north of the Fertile Crescent to parts of modern day Syria, Turkey, Iran, and Iraq. Um, this is a very rich and fertile land with many rivers and rolling plains for large herds of sheep, uh, which could feed a large population. So therefore, they were able to support a big um, group of professionals and craftsmen, and people were able to specialize in certain crafts because of that abundant food supply. Um, so when we look at the Assyrians, like I said, they were adept metal workers, and they applied this to things like creating the first door locks, um, they used arches. They were some of the first to use paved roads. They had a postal system in place, the first to use iron. Like I said, they were wonderful metal workers. Um, the first library, the first plumbing and flush toilets. Thank you very much. Uh, the first guitars and the use of an aqueduct to transport water. Um, so very advanced civilization. Also, the first university was founded here. So um, they, people were studying theology, philosophy, and medicine. So we see two phases of the Assyrian Empire. The first is from 1430 to 954. And then we have what's called the Neo-Assyrian Empire from 934, when that's when they moved the capital to Nineveh in 705, or in this case, 700. Um, so this was a major power center for the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Like the Egyptians, the ancient Near Eastern art uh, shows hybrid beings. So you can see these winged people here. Um, and similar to the Sphinx where we had a, a lion head, or lion with the head of a man, we have people here with the wings of a bird. So um, in addition to the Lama Sioux that had the bulls with the wings and the human heads, we'll see these kind of composite figures like um, female figures with the head of a lioness, uh, scorpions with men's heads and other composite creatures and their exact meaning is not entirely known but um, they were using these kinds of relief carvings meaning um, carving detail into the rock to create these uh, art pieces and different types of wall treatments were used not only these kinds of carved reliefs but like I said those um, cone mosaics were taking those bits of uh, terracotta clay in the shape of a cone and creating mosaics on the wall with those. They also painted walls with frescoes and um, using a base of white lime, they were painting in different kinds of uh, flat tones without the use of shading or perspective, but also depicting these kind of mythical beasts and very fancifully styled uh, trees and so forth like we saw with those palm trees with um, the abstracted palm fronds. The next civilization or um, community that's going to rise in this area are the Persians. Um, and they conquered Babylon, Babylon in uh, 538 under the rule of Cyrus the Great. Um, so now the Mesopotamian is now controlled by the Persian Empire under Cyrus. And he also captured the Assyrian Empire, then went on to capture Egypt. 
And at one point, the Persian Empire stretched from Europe to all the way over to the Indus Valley in India. It's a huge empire. Um, they moved the capital from place to place, but the greatest capital of all was this one. It's called Persepolis, and it was built in 518 BC. So let's take a closer look at that next. So Persepolis, which means city of Persians in Greek, uh, was founded by Darius I and um, took about 60 years to build under his rule and then also followed up by his son Xerxes. But it's a series of platforms around 20 to 50 feet wide um, surrounding uh, and kind of terracing up the side of a sacred mountain. So it, they have these kind of low terraces too that enable people to ride horseback through the city. Um, and so also the city is ringed with a carving of this endless kind of parade of soldiers rimming the city, showing the might of the Persian army. Um, this also shows a giant audience hall that was 200 feet square feet with 36 columns that are 64 feet tall, which is what you're going to see the remnants of on the next slide. These structures called Apandana are a hippostyle hall. Um, you can see with one side open to the exterior. So remember that hippostyle, is, hippostyle hall is full of columns and um, it has these verandas on three sides in this case. So this was also um, used, the, the entire interior of the rooms were um, faced with ceramic tile with brightly colored ceramics depicting animals and flowers and other kinds of composite creatures, again, like lions and griffins. Notice the U-shaped capitals with the bulls. That's a unique Persian um, support for the roof structure. So you can see at the top of the column, there are those two bulls kind of facing out, creating that U bracket that the lintel rests in that helps support the roof. Um, so another important detail for the Persian style. The Persian army had gone into Athens and sacked the Acropolis and destroyed some of the temples there. And so in retaliation to that, when Alexander the Great and his Greek forces from Macedonia uh, then captured Persepolis, they, um, Alexander had intended to save the city because it was the most beautiful city in the ancient world. But the, his um, troops had other ideas and it said they, they got drunk and they destroyed the city. Um, so unfortunately, um, all we have left here are these ruins, but you can see the pylon or those portals with the cornice on the top and then the relief carving of the Persian um, army. One thing that Alexander the Great did that was quite ingenious was he would befriend, uh, when he would invade an area, he would defend or befriend the leaders of the area and keep them in charge. So this is one way he was able to um, keep a power base under him while he's expanded his empire. But this was a very, very wealthy city from treasures from all these rich trade routes. So it was located in this hub um, the Middle East is still a hub of trade coming, you know, from goods coming in from Asia and um, Africa and different places and then moving into Europe and vice versa. So this citadel was full of gold, silver, and jewels. And um, these were also revenue that um, were paid in taxes to King Cyrus, who was the current king at the time. It was estimated there was 2,500 tons of gold in the city when it was sacked in um, 530 BCE. Or three, I'm sorry, it was sacked in 330. It was the capital from 550 to 330 BC, BCE. <laughs> like the Egyptians, only a few people sat on chairs that you see here, and this is a throne chair showing Darius with his son Xerxes behind him. Notice that they are using a lathe. Remember that tool that spun a um, branch of wood so that it could be turned and carved into these um, three-dimensional 360 carvings going around the perimeter of the leg. And you can see that on the stretchers as well. And so we have only have a clue from the um, carvings on this, the stone carvings about what some of the furniture looked like. But typical, like we uh, talked about with ancient Egypt, most people would sit on mats on the floor 
or they would have built-in diases again around the perimeter of the room that would then be um, you know padded and put pillows on it or uh, woven fiber things like rugs and um, the majority of the people use that as a form of seating and this type of chair that you see here would be reserved for the nobles or the king or the elite. Here's a mosaic said to be depicting what Alexander the Great looked like. Of course, this is pure speculation, but um, we will talk more about Alexander later. Why he's significant is because he invaded this large swath of territory. He spread um, ideas of Greek culture through a large area. So we'll see um, there's actually what's called Greco-Buddhism that arrived in India with the Greek um, artisans that came with Alexander's forces and brought a new style of depicting Buddha uh, into that area of India. So we'll, we'll be talking about that in a couple weeks. Now, unfortunately, not th these sites are still under threat. Um, Alexander's forces destroyed Persepolis, but some of these UNESCO World Heritage Sites are still under attack um, through ISIS. So um, what you see here is someone taking off the face of a Lamassu from the Nineveh Gate. And you might ask yourself, why? Um, why would someone destroy something that's from our collective world heritage? Well, it's that idea of iconoclasm. Um, they believe that it's not proper to show the human face, but it goes beyond that. Um, we'll see on the next slide, they actually completely destroyed the Nineveh Gate also and just turned it into rubble. There were sacred sites in Mosul that have been completely destroyed. So, um, you know, of course, warfare and terrorism is very um, hard on the human population and we have a huge refugee crisis because of it but it's also quite um, hard on our shared um, artistic treasures and that though they're under threat as well Palmyra was an ancient Roman city a uh, Roman outpost that became what they called the Venice of the desert because it was also on those rich trade routes from Asia into Europe and back and forth. Um, so there was a lot of money coming in from what we call the Silk Road trade routes. And the ruins had covered three square miles in the middle of a desert situated near Oasis. Um, but unfortunately, ISIS is dismantling the city piece by piece and selling off bits on the black market to support their cause. So this is why it's very important to um, of course, if you ever, you know, win the lotto and you want to buy something from antiquity to not buy it on the black market, because a lot of times, um, you know, people will loot sacred sites like this or historic or symbolic or sites that are, again, part of our shared history and humanity and uh, sell it for their own personal gain. If you would like to know more about the endangered antiquities of the Middle East, uh, there's two articles here about that. Um, of course, we know there's a horrible civil war going on in Syria and the city of Aleppo, who's an ancient historic city um, with cultural influences because another important trade route source. Um, anyway, the people are working there to try to move some of the antiquities out of harm's way but about 140 historic buildings have been damaged beyond repair. So um, again, just to point out that war takes a terrible toll on everything from people to countries to buildings and animals, wildlife, environment, etc. cetera. So uh, yeah, not good for anything. The reason we know so much about uh, the furniture is because of these preserved carvings from the past. And again, it shows the use of the lathe to create these uh, turned legs and ornamental um, details. The Middle Eastern furniture for the wealthy tended to show a lot of inlay depicted. Um, the wood would typically um, 
again be reserved for the wealthy where the middle class would probably have some kind of a woven reed seating situation or a cushion on the floor for the lower class. Um, the use of stools though were also prevalent. So the four-legged and folding stools used here also maybe even earlier than Egypt. So the, what we know about the Middle Eastern furniture from these carvings again give us no clues to the construction. So we do know see its use as a ceremonial chair we do know that it's been carved, uh, but we don't know if they used a dovetail joint or mortise and tenon joint. Uh, we can only surmise that from these pictures. We do know that they use stylized animal and plant forms um, and human forms as well in their decorative furniture. So you can see these kind of stylized pine cone feet for the chair um, on the left. We have what's called an anthemion border for the middle chair, which is kind of a stylized honeysuckle. And then we have those ram's heads on the stool or that throne on the right. So um, once again, these would be carved from wood and um, inlaid with different materials. Note the person of the male figure reclining or in a semi-reclining position dining and leaning on one elbow, and then the woman um, sitting on a chair adjacent to that um, sofa or, clou or couch, or what we, we're going to later call a lectus or a cline. So it's thought that that custom of lounging with your legs out and dining kind of in a semi-reclining um, mode came from the Middle East during this time. And it was adopted by the Greeks and then later the Romans in their furniture that we'll see coming up. Metalworking in Mesopotamia has gone back thousands of years from estimated around 6,000 BC. Um, and it, they were using all different types of techniques such as lost wax casting as seen here, which is when you're um, building a model out of wax, then you create a mold around that model then you pour the hot metal in and the wax melts away, but it retains the sculpture that you made from wax and creates this fantastic shape. <clears throat> They're also using different types of filigree, like you see on the um, robe of the, the bowl here, a cloisonne, uh, which we'll talk about in more detail, which is also something the Egyptians used, which is taking metal wires and then inlaying uh, colorful enamel inside of that. Um, so again, many skillful um, cultures in metalwork and producing a variety of um, objects from things of copper, lead, and um, actually gold and silver, and also bronze, which is an alloy of copper and tin. Here's a beautiful example of Mesopotamian metalwork um, in what's called repose, which is <clears throat> taking a piece of, uh, in this case, gold, and then you're pounding on it from the back to create these lifted patterns in the metal. And you can see again those fantastical creatures um, such as griffins and so forth depicted on this breastplate, which would have been again something that would hung on someone's chest um, as an ornamental piece. As in many world cultures, ceramics was developed early on and it has a long history in this area as well. And um, the pottery was usually largely at first plain and utilitarian and buff in color, like you see here, um, later painted and adding more ornamentation and different colored glazes. Um, and so Usually they have this type of, um, in this case, you've got a pitcher with a, a spout, but later uh, they would use also glazed terracotta to make larger figures such as guard animals and statuary in, in ceramics. It was said that glass was first developed in Mesopotamia about 5,000 years ago. And the story goes because glass is made of silica, which is in sand, um, and that's mixed with alkaline ash from burst, burnt coastal plants uh, to create this molten glass. And so the story goes that people along the shoreline of the Persian Gulf and Mediterranean were burning coastal plants 
in the sand for a bonfire and then they saw that the silica in the sand became molten and they started to be able to use that to create um, these incredible image or you know items like this particular bowl from per the Persian Empire um, as a matter of fact they started blowing glass which is taking again that hot molten glass and blowing through a tube to create a vessel like this bowl uh, as early as the first century BCE and so again glass making is traced back to about 3500 BC in Mesopotamia and it was thought to have really started around coastal North Syria and they were making glass beads and as we know we saw faience in Egypt which is um, using alkali seashore plants along with sodium carbonate um, to create those kinds of um, what they call paste glass also. Another important art form, which is still an important art form in the Middle East to this day, is textiles and the weaving of rugs and other types of cloth. Um, so there was exports of wool before 2000 BC, because remember this was an area that they had large um, herds of sheep and goats, and it stayed an important decorative art in the area. But um, because of all of these different crafts traveling back and forth um, along different trade routes that um, later will be called the silk routes or the silk roads, uh, there was all different types of goods and things coming from in from China, such as silk, and then being exported to China, such as Persian cobalt or textiles again. So typically from west to east, uh, the, the people in Asia liked Western horses. They were larger than the Eastern horses. Um, and then bridles and saddles and so forth. Grapes and um, winemaking was transported west to east. Dogs, uh, fur trading, honey, glass, like we talked about, wool and textiles and weapons and armor, also gold and silver metalwork. From east to west, from Asia coming into the Middle East um, and then up into Europe was silk, uh, tea and rice, different types of dyes, different types of precious stones, and then later Chinese porcelain, also spices um, and perfume, bronze, and gunpowder from China again later, paper from China later, and medicine as well as different textiles coming in from India, which was a which we'll talk about in week four. But what you're seeing here is Petra. Um, this is a ancient um, crossroads of, of, for the spice trade. It's a as a spot that there was um, crossroads from Arabia and Egypt and Syria. Um, again, ch exchanging goods coming in from China and spices from India. And that's known for these incredible hand carved temples and tombs that are in this pink sandstone uh, created about 2000 years ago. So let's take a closer look at how they created these um, incredible buildings in Petra. This city is uh, entered by a very narrow ravine called the shaft in the eastern entrance of this valley or this ravine with these tall sandstone walls. And this is in Southern Jordan. And it was estimated to have been inhabited since prehistoric times from about 10,000 years ago. But uh, when these temples were built was about 2,000 years ago. And it's in pink sandstone. They also had a whole water system that supported about 30,000 residents at one time with different aqueducts and underwater tunnels and so forth. The entrance to this was a closely guarded secret because it was quite a wealthy area because of all that trade and they didn't want people to come in and and rob them basically or take it over. Um, so when we look at some of the different structures that we'll see on the next slide, I'll discuss how they created them. So this one, El Dier, which is the monastery, um, is a mixture of Hellenistic Greek style and Mesopotamian styles. It was a tomb um, for King Obodas I, and it was also used as a church during Byzantine rule. It's been repurposed actually many times, um, and this has this whole mix of influences. So what was interesting about this is they realized um, they were able to carve these from the top down. So in order to start carving these um, tombs and 
structures, they would walk up the hill or climb up this hill and then start to carve at the top and then use the rubble falling down as a scaffolding so that they could work their way across the front and continue to carve until they reach ground level again. So this is why sometimes the proportions are a little off. Notice how the second floor looks larger than the first floor. Maybe they just didn't estimate <laughs> to get, you know, before they hit back to bedrock. So uh, again, these are these incredible carvings in ancient Petra. We can't leave our discussion of ancient Middle East without talking about the Phoenicians who lived on the area of coastal Syria and Lebanon in North Israel. So you can see on the map here um, that those areas of Sidon and Tyre. Um, and so they were very skilled seafarers and shipbuilders. <clears throat> here you see an example of one of their ships and they were wonderful traders. So as you can see with those red lines, they established trade routes all through the Mediterranean basin and even out through the Straits of Gibraltar <clears throat> as far north um, around the Iberian Peninsula and then even down into North Africa. So they were going all the way up to France um, and again, all the way around the Iberian Peninsula, as far north as Britain, it's estimated. And um, they also made it over to the Red Sea. So they were exporters of wood, specifically cedar from the forests of Syria <clears throat> and textiles. Again, wool, linen and cotton that was being produced in the Middle East um, was an important trade item. But what they're mainly known for is this important dye that they developed. This dye is called Tyrian purple, and it's made from this murex shell, and it actually takes um, several thousand of these shells to produce a small amount of dye. So the um, the shell there is what's your, you know, the, is a, a, a mollusk that you're seeing there on the left. And um, <clears throat> they would take again about 10,000 of these to produce a, a, a bolt of cloth. But they would produce um, colors in the range of, you know, more of a deep purple. And you can see it woven with gold. That's the cloak of King Charlemagne from Tyrian purple and gold thread. But they would also um, dye it pink. And, um, you know, the this was such a, um, big trade commodity but it was really expensive so only people that were very wealthy could afford Tyrian purple so purple became associated with as a sign of wealth um, and they also had another dye from a murex snail that was created, created this beautiful blue and it's the same blue that you see in the flag of israel that blue and white and that comes from another murex snail that's found along the shoreline there um, and produces that blue color in dye The Phoenicians also acted as kind of a middleman in the trade routes. Um, so they were working with um, importing copper from Cyprus, silver and iron from Spain, gold from Ethiopia, tin from Britain, ivory from India, amber from the Baltic states, um, barley and honey and, and um, oak wood from Palestine, linen and grain from Egypt and livestock and even things like coral, perfume, and spices. So these were some of the items that the Phoenicians themselves made were these um, glass vessels that you see here on the left and these little interesting glass beads with bearded faces. Uh, that was another Phoenician trade item. That, that's one way they've been able to track how far their products went is where they've found these beads. Um, and then you can also see that uh, copper vessel, that's another one that would have been traded during this time period. So we're talking about from 3200 BCE to 2500 BCE was kind of their peak um, of that civilization. Not only were the Phoenicians ingenious shipbuilders, they also were notable for doing wonderful architecture. So they used a combination of limestone and mud brick and they created these large temples uh, with colonnades. Remember those groupings of columns. They also were creating dams, artificial harbors, walled cities with towers and gates, um, abundant use of cedar wood from the area, multi-story houses with two columns at the entrance like you see here on this temple design. And they, it's believed their writing influenced uh, the development of Greek writing. They were also quite influenced by Egyptian architecture. So 
you can see some of the like the cornice at the top and the monumental uh, look of the Phoenician architecture. But notice the um, columns on the next page. It's that stylized palm frond again, like we saw at the Ishtar Gate and the Processional Way of Babylon, uh, is going to then become what's called a Ionic column eventually when we study Greek architecture coming up. So the Phoenicians were, uh, because of their trade routes, also spreading different ideas and motifs throughout the Mediterranean basin. And so we see again these kind of stylized palm fronds um, being used on this capital or this fragment from a Phoenician column. And then we'll see those kinds of motifs used in our um, study of the ancient cultures around the Mediterranean basin near Greece next. Okay, now we're going to move over to uh, the Aegean area of the Mediterranean and take a look at some of the civilizations living there. The early civilization on the Cyclades Islands, um, then the Minoan civilization based around um, Crete, which is now modern day Crete, and the Palace of Knossos, and then the Mycenaean civilization that's on the what is now the Greek mainland, which is slightly dater than the other two. So let's talk about those next. When you see the map of this area, those small islands again are the Cyclades, you can see where now um, Athens would be in Greece, and then notice the large 60 mile long island of Crete and Knossos, and this is one of the major centers of, for the Minoan culture. The Minoans was said to have migrated from the area of Turkey and Iran. They're a Bronze Age culture, and they were said to be quite tall. They're about six feet tall, which is unusual for the time. Um, and they were, um, again, also known as big sea traders like the Phoenicians. So uh, let's take a look at their civilization. There were four large um, palace sites on the island of Crete uh, that were occupied by the Minoans or built by the Minoans, the largest of which is Knossos. But um, we have Phaestos, Malia, and Zakros as well. And these were complex structures, about two to three stories high, that acted as administration sites, trade centers, uh, and they were also the center for both their religious and political power base. Uh, there's no fortification on these palaces, so they believe that they lived in peaceful coexistence with each other. Um, and, you know, they did have some weapons, but uh, they, again, the, um, the building itself isn't fortified like we saw with the Middle Eastern buildings. So it's thought that they led a relatively peaceful existence. Um, and they were, again, were fearless traders going throughout the Mediterranean, the Near East, Africa, and Egypt. If you look at that floor plan of the palace on the slide before, and you see the somewhat maze-like space plan of it, um, notice that it's arranged around a central courtyard and that was thought that the, maybe the palace itself gave rise to the legend of the labyrinth. Uh, you can see the labyrinth here, that maze-like structure also seen on the Minoan money or currency. Um, the legend is that King Minos made the Athenians um, send a tribute of seven young males and seven young females every nine years to be fed to the Minotaur, which is half man, half bull. And at one point Theseus, one of the Greek young men um, was able to uh, convince King Minos' daughter, Adrian, to give him a ball of thread. So he used that to wind his way into the maze. When he got to the heart of the maze, he slayed the labyrinth, or he slayed the minotaur, and he was able to make his way back out of the labyrinth following that ball of string, or that, that string trail that he left for himself. So again, the, this thought that perhaps the palace itself gave rise to that, that story. This is an artist's rendition of what the palace might have looked like, but the city of Knossos itself was thought to have had a population of about 100,000 um, at this point, at their apex of their culture. And um, the palace was enormous. It's about 320 feet from north to south, about 500 feet east to west, all built around that rectangular center courtyard. And um, it has some other amazing elements, such as a light well, which we'll see in a few slides, 
So it's also, um, like I said, wasn't built for defense. You can see it's just kind of cascading in terraces down the side of the hill. Uh, many rooms were left open uh, to frame views of the, the landscape and, um, you know, to create that circulation pattern. Things were quite open and there was a lot of staircases leading from one area to, an, to another with long corridors also. So um, let's take a closer look at the palace. The way that we experience the ruins of Knossos today is due to a man named Sir Arthur Evans. Uh, he was British and he worked to restore the palace for 35 years. He also found written tablets, um, which he called Linear A and Linear B. Uh, most of the information was about recording goods. Remember, they were traders. But um, he did what he, he called his best guesses in restoring the palace. So he did things that were very you know, big no-no today in archaeology, such as using reinforcing concrete um, to help rebuild some of the pal palace structure. Uh, he did publish 20 or four, excuse me, publish four volumes of work uh, about his discoveries here at Knossos. But um, he, again, just made his best guesses, which some criticized the accuracy of his choices. The Minoan name comes from the name King Minos, which could be an individual um, ruler or a dynastic title, like a pharaoh would be for Egyptians. But in any event, um, it's now called the Minoan civilization after that title. And um, it was a Bronze Age civilization that flourished from about 3000 BCE to 1100 BCE. But um, you can see the artistic representation of the palace of King Minos at, and the palace of Knossos, which um, is historically significant, is that it served as the major settlement uh, for the civilization. And this location was um, settled from about 6,000, 7,000 BC until it was abandoned in 1375 BC. And we'll talk about why that happened uh, coming up. The Minoan architecture is known for these unique columns that taper a smaller diameter at the base of the column and a wider diameter at the top, which is unusual. Most columns would be the opposite, where the base of the column would be a larger diameter and it would taper smaller at the top. These were carved from wood, so it was said that they took timber from the hillsides and basically smoothed it down and turned the tree on its head, if you will, so that the part of the tree that flares out to the roots would be the top of the column. And so this is clad in what's called a pillow capital. That's that red band at the top that looks sort of like a yoga meditation pillow. And so Minoan architecture was, you know, unusual and graceful in this way, um, very colorful. So you can see it's painted in these kind of very bright reds and blues, blacks, and just a lot of using a lot of contrast that gives it some great dimension. They were also using the stones on the site. So they were using native stone and clay as well as timber uh, to reinforce the construction. The more color, um, common color motif for the columns was that the column was red and the capital black, like you see in this slide. The slide before showed a black column with the red capital, but this red column with the black top and bottom um, on the base and capital were more typical. You can also see this with an entablature, which is that horizontal um, member spanning the front of the building, in this case showing these kind of white um, either solar disk or moon disks that um, as a motif across the front. One important architectural detail that is found in the Palace of Knossos is the light well. So basically this is a large skylight that illuminates a multiple story um, building, in this case, the grand staircase, that's supported by these columns. And that big skylight helps illuminate the different levels of the stairs so people can navigate those um, more effectively. Of course, because they didn't have any sort of interior lighting other than you know lamp light and so forth or torch light. 
So um, this light well we'll see used in later centuries. Um, so for example, Victor Horta in the Art Nouveau period will use a light well in his Hotel Tessel in Belgium. So again, this is the light well at the Temple of Knossos Creek. When you look at the uh, floor plan of the palace, it can look somewhat chaotic and haphazardly laid out, but in fact it is all organized around that central courtyard and rooms flow from one to another. So the palace has more flow than one might imagine. And they also have these long corridors and then those all terminate in those big um, light well staircases that we saw in the last slide. So um, they're also finally decorated with fresco that's done in true fresco fashion which is uh, fresco being the italian word for fresh it's when pigment is applied to freshly laid lime plaster while the plaster is still wet so this is difficult because you can only work while the plaster is wet um, once the plaster is dry um, you know that that only gives them a few hours to work and so once it's dry they have to start again with another patch of, of wet plaster so once the plaster um, dries, it absorbs the pigment and it creates this beautiful, colorful effect that you see here. Notice also the um, motifs have a lot to do with water in the Minoan fresco. So you can see these kind of watery elements and spiral shapes as a dominant motif. Makes sense that since they're on an island, right? <laughs> One of the most significant rooms in the palace has been labeled the throne room by Arthur Evans uh, because of this gypsum stone throne and council benches which seat 16 people around that um, perimeter of the room. But if you look on the next slide, uh, next couple slides, that theory has been somewhat disputed in that because it was a goddess worshiping culture, is, there's also some thought that this was perhaps a religious um, room that maybe the a priestess that act as the goddess sat on the throne. And the reason we think this might be the case is because there's also a ritual bath um, or some kind of a bath that holds water. And we don't know if it was used as an aquarium, a place to bathe, or why there was a water feature in the room, and then um, a fire that would have been burning. So it seems um, you could surmise that there was some sort of a, a bath for purification or some kind of a fire ritual going on. Um, or it could have been, again, for the, the ruler. But we see the symbols on the wall that represent, relate to the goddess. So it seems, and I'm going to vote for, <laughs> it was more of a, a ritual room for religious purposes. So in this slide, you can see that they're using trabeated construction or post and lintel construction with those vertical columns supporting those horizontal members to support the floor above it. And you can see that built in bath that I was referring to before. They did have plumbing. Um, they had ceramic pipes and that used gravity to feed one area of the palace to another. Um, these Columns again are from cypress and oaks that once were found on the, the hillside. And um, it, you notice the stone and so forth that was also from the island. And um, that basin there was for the fire. On the frescoes from the throne room, which have been restored, so they're not um, in the original condition which they were found, uh, they are showing some of the motifs I was referring to. So. Notice the lily flowers. That's another flower that's a symbol of rebirth because it's one that dies all the way back in the winter and then springs forth vigorously again in the spring. Um, and so that's a, a sacred symbol to them. And then notice the um, lion with the eagle head and the spirals. Um, and so it's interesting too, you can see these kind of um, like waves of energy patterns or colors, you know, at the bottom underneath the, the griffin figure. So um, let's take a look at some other sacred symbols from the Minoans. As I said, they were a goddess worshiping society and they worshiped the basically Earth Mother. 
Um, and one of the priestess's sim sacred symbols was called a labrys, which is here seen as the double-headed axe. Um, and it's also the, where the term labyrinth comes from. So it's a symbol of the goddess and also they, one of their holiest symbols. Uh, they also worshiped a butterfly goddess who was part of the mother earth goddess. And that double-headed axe was said to represent her wings. So this axe was only to be used by priestesses and it was thought perhaps they used it to sacrifice animals, um, especially bulls, they'd slit their throat, but we don't know that for sure, for certain, but um, you can see this um, scene of the goddess or the priestesses. Um, again, the just like the Egyptians, the female figures are shown with the lighter skin tone and the male figures with a darker skin tone. And um, that was just a artistic convention to be able to differentiate between the men and the women, since the men and women both had long hair and wore similar clothing. Um, and it was also perhaps a thought that perhaps the priestesses spent more times indoors um, doing their ceremonies and so forth. So they might have had lighter skin from just not being out in the sun as much. This is another artistic representation of uh, what Arthur Evans labeled the Queen's Quarters. And because it was this very beautiful room with this large view. Um, and notice the aquatic motifs and the beautiful ceiling. We'll take a look at some of those details coming up. So in this fresco, you see animals that were found around the island. So we see common dolphins with their um, kind of hourglass patch of cream and white. Um, and they're called common dolphins because they're found in many oceans of the world black sea urchins, and of course, all different types of fish. And then we have what's called a um, running dog or Vitruvian spiral motif um, with those interlocking swirls. And what's called a rosette motif, which are those individual flower forms. Uh, so again, this combination creates this beautiful, lively space that was labeled the queen's quarters, although we don't in fact know who used this space. So I've included some of these kind of illustrations in the PowerPoint. Sometimes it's easier to pick out the details when it's just illustrated graphically like this. But you can see the rosette border there, which is again, usually flowers based on radial symmetry, meaning have a center point and then the petals rain out like um, the axles on a wheel. And then fretwork, which is that kind of interlocking labyrinth type of a design. Um, we'll talk about the meaning of that in the next class. The geosh border, um, which is the kind of an interwoven spiraling effect, and the spiral running spiral border. Um, also, just you can see all over geometric design. So this is interesting because a lot of cultures use this, and it's called a seed of life pattern. It's basically how a cell replicates from a single cell or um, to a multi-cell as, a, as a, you know, an organism starts to grow. And we see that, again, used in a lot of these ancient cultures. So it's interesting how sometimes they will depict things that now modern science has proven to be true. So this is the incredible ceiling detail of the Queen's Quarters with the running spiral motif. Again, that's called a Vitruvian scroll or running dog motif, um, but it's these kind of swirling spirals. And if you think about living on an island with the wave action and the eddying of the water into tide pools and so forth, you can definitely see where these spiral shapes might have emerged. Um, and then, of course, they're offset with those rosettes, those little flower forms. So this is something I'd like to encourage you guys to do as designers for the 21st century is to think more about ceiling surfaces. It's a large blank canvas, basically, and it's usually very underdeveloped in today's design. This is another restored fresco, and so we don't know how accurate some of these are, but we do know, uh, based on other artifacts that were found, that the Minoan women uh, had very tight belt that they typically wore with a short 
um, kind of like a shrug or jacket with bare breasts. And then they had, uh, oftentimes their hair was adorned with shells and pearls and things from the ocean, like you see here. So uh, again, just based on other statuary and things that were found on the site, uh, this is a, uh, another best guess, I think. But notice that with the artwork, um, and this is what the we do know about the Minoan artwork, there's this very lively quality to it. So it's thought that the, um, the Minoans were very peace loving. They were sea traders, like I said, they didn't, their settlements weren't fortified for war. And their um, artwork just depicts this very um, vibrant, very playful kind of society. This fresco, the Prince of the Lilies, is showing a royal figure, they think like a priestly king, leading a processional toward that central courtyard. So this was painted in the corridor leading to the courtyard. Called Prince of the Lilies because you can see those stylized lily forms again. And remember I said that that represented rebirth. And then we see the butterfly goddess there flying along uh, next to the prince as well. So um, these types of... Uh, Frescoes seem to have a religious connotation of uh, showing some of the religious rituals that the society uh, practices, practiced during this time. One of the more dramatic religious rituals was the um, act of bull riding or bull vaulting. And so um, there's many depictions of this type of activity where it shows both young men and women who are very athletic running towards a charging bull, grabbing its horns, vaulting over the back with a, some sort of a somersault and um, landing on the other side. So again, we're, we're not sure if this was actually possible to do, but it's very similar to how, you know, a, a gymnast, have you ever seen the US a women's gymnastic team and they run charging toward that, that vault and that leather um, thing and they, they leap and then do like a handspring or over it and then land. So if you can imagine that with a charging bull. So some theories say, you know, this just is impossible. You couldn't do this. Others have said, no, you could if you leapt straight over the horns without touching the bull, which you can see on this one, it shows, looks like the youth is grabbing onto the horns to uh, vault over it. In a, whatever way, if it was just more metaphorical, it was in honor of the mother goddess, they believe. So again, that was that earth goddess who was, some of her sacred symbols were the bull, the snake, the dove, and the butterfly. And she was a guardian of everything from, you know, animals of the earth, sea, and sky. So um, some people believe it just was the artist's failure to show proper perspective that it looks like they're doing this kind of activity. But there's also um, sculpture that shows the leapers going over the bull's horns. So again, some, somewhat of a mystery, but it was ten, thought to be some sort of a ritual or religious rite. So speaking of religious symbols, this is the Minoan snake goddess, um, and she's made of theance. So remember that Egyptian material um, and that material itself symbolized the renewal of life because you're kind of taking this powdered quartz and so forth and then and the silica and then pressing it into molds like this one to create a new form so uh, it's a symbol again of life renewing itself and also snakes of course we know are a symbol of life renewing itself because they shed their skin and then they get a new one all the time and snakes are often symbols of uh, energy like so for example kundalini energy um, in the Hindu religion where it's like the energy going up the spine like a snake. Um, the snakes in the Minoan culture were protectors of the house and the temple and a symbol of fertility. You also see the owl perched on the goddess's head um, which is a symbol of wisdom and um, these are all you know adding together showing that that mother earth goddess. Another notable thing about Minoan architecture was their use of the natural landscape, like digging into caves and hills to become part of the building. And we see that here with these storeroom areas of the palace, 
And these are also holding these large five foot tall clay storage vases. And this was like I said, I remember a administrative site. So this is where people would pay taxes and things like dried fish, olive oil, grains, and so forth um, that were given as tribute to the palace um, and as their fair share of tax. And uh, they found many, many of these very large storage jars. So the Minoans did use ceramic arts um, and later used a potter's wheel, but some of these were hand formed. The colors are usually often buff gray or red in the ceramics, but um, sometimes decorated with spirals and motifs, and especially marine motifs for very popular. The common motif from Minoan uh, design is the octopus, and you see that a lot on the vases from Crete. Uh, this is about 11 inches tall, made from clay, and you can see how they use the shape of the vase to really encapsulate the movement of the octopus with the eight arms kind of winding around the vase. And this was another um, big food source. It still is in the Mediterranean. Um, so the octopus was a important animal to the culture. So as I mentioned before, the Minoans were big traders and um, I mean trade, not traitors, but traders, T-R-A-D-E-R-S. Uh, and they traded with different cultures, such as the Egyptians and different cultures in um, Asia Minor and Middle East and uh, Syria. They traded for copper, tin, ivory, and gold. And you can see the, um, the use of the copper and the tin together in this bronze octopus cup from the Minoan culture. Um, and so, again, this was just another example of showing that some of their trade connections throughout the Mediterranean. On this vase, and also remember on the Prince of the Lilies fresco, um, it's depicted what looks like peacock feathers. So peacocks aren't naturally found in the Mediterranean. So this is another example of proof that they traded with outside areas, in this case, perhaps India or Africa, where um, a certain form of peacock would be found. And you can see those kind of feathers on the headdress of the Prince of the Lilies, and then also on this vase. And um, peacocks tend to be another motif that we'll see repeated um, in many different times and places in many different cultures. And you see that here with the Minoans. And another important symbol to the Minoans were bees. Bees were believed to be a sacred insect uh, connecting the natural world to the underworld. And um, the, this particular pendant was found in a tomb near the third largest palace, which is the Palace of Malia on Crete. Um, beekeeping was used in Crete to create um, fermented honey, which is mead. And um, they were good beekeepers, but this particular pendant is made from gold with granulation, meaning they're using tiny little beads that are soldered on to create this textural effect on the, the tail of the bee and on the flower and so forth. Um, bees be, stayed an important symbol um, and bees, beekeepers or bee goddesses were named Melissa. So if your name is Melissa, you have a connection to um, the beekeepers of the ancient world. Uh, the um, Egyptians were thought to be the first people to really cultivate bees and, and use them um, in beekeeping because they used honey for not only food sources but medicinal purposes to treat wounds and so forth. A settlement that was part of the Minoan culture was found on the cyclotic island of Thera in the Aegean and it's now called Santorini. And um, there was a large volcanic eruption that devastated Thera in about 1600 BC. So the impacts to the other island settlements and on Crete itself were huge in that there were uh, earthquakes and tsunamis. <clears throat> and it's this volcanic event was said to be one of the largest volcanic events in recorded history. So it was quite powerful and explosive. There was very few human remains found on the island though, so it was thought that there was a series of lesser earthquakes and eruptions prior to the major one, 
which gave, <clears throat> excuse me, which gave the population a chance to pack up and flee the island. Um, and this also led to the downfall of the Minoan culture because with, due to the earthquakes, the ash fall and the tsunamis, it was thought to have destabilized the Minoan economy and making them vulnerable to invasion by the Mycenaean culture, which we'll talk about next. In Plato's writing, he alludes to the lost city of Atlantis and the sinking of Atlantis under the sea. And it's thought that perhaps the <clears throat> explosion that happened on Akrotiri uh, in 1627 could have been part of the genesis of that story because part of the island sank um, and over these course of all these volcanic eruptions. This site was not discovered until 1967 when it started to be excavated. And it was, um, the frescoes on the walls are very well preserved because of the ash and the, um, if you've ever seen any artifacts from Pompeii, uh, that's another reason why Pompeii was so well preserved is the fact that it was covered in ash. And um, so let's take a look at some of these frescoes that give us a clue about society here on Thera. So these frescoes were painted on the houses, house walls of prosperous inhabitants. So these would be interior design details. And uh, it gives us a clue again about their culture. So you can see they were also a very seagoing culture since they lived on an island. And we see the same kind of flotilla of boats um, that we've also saw in the Minoan, well, this is part of the Minoan culture, but what we saw in, in Crete. So you can see the um, different types of vessels uh, along with the common dolphin and the other aquatic motifs that let us know that these two cultures were very much um, one and the same and connected. We see the use of the same kind of color palette in the frescoes, which are again mineral-based pigments. And um, these kinds of motifs like the lily again, uh, representing rebirth. But we also have some quite unusual frescoes here on Akrotiri, which we'll see next. This was one of the unusual ones I was talking about, the blue monkeys climbing on a volcanic landscape. And this was discovered in 1969. Um, and it's showing the fact that they did have trade routes with Africa. Uh, these animals would have come from that region. And we see another one with antelope coming up as well that would not have normally, of course, been found on Greek islands. So these would be, have been animals that they were exposed to via their trade routes and travel. The spring fresco is significant because it's one of the first to be found without depicting human figures. So in other words, it's the first landscape painting that's um, been discovered from antiquity. And it's uh, another example of a fresco where we have mineral-based pigments um, and applied to wet plaster. And notice the very lifelike forms of the flowers. Again, we see the lilies, that symbol of rebirth, mixed in with the swallows, uh, which is symbol of spring, which is why it's called the spring frescoes. The Akrotiri frescoes also show some unusual scenes that we didn't see on Crete, such as these boxing boys. And um, notice they have shaved heads with long braids. And we don't know exactly what, if this is just depicting an athletic competition, it's some sort of a ritual function. There were signs of mechanical devices used to create these frescoes, meaning they used a grid system to lay out the proportions of the figure and they used spirals to uh, calculate proportion as well. And um, you can see that here, although on the next fresco of the fisherman, to me, the figure seems a bit out of proportion, like the legs look short compared to the height of the torso. The figures are shown like the Egyptian frescoes where the figure is in profile, except for the shoulders and upper body looks like it's turned toward the viewer, but the face and the rest of the, the figure is in uh, profile view. 
So when we talk about the Cycladic culture, these is a culture that's lived out on these islands for centuries. <clears throat> There's early and middle and late period. So the early period began about 3000 BC. The middle period's 2500 BC and the late period about 2000 BC when it essentially converged with the Minoan civilization. But prior to that, um, it, again, it was this island, uh, more earth-based culture, meaning that they lived lightly off the land by growing wild barley and um, herding sheep and goats and pigs. They fished for tuna from small boats. So they basically speared the tuna off the boat. <clears throat> and they um, did this type of artwork that was quite different too. It's a very distinctive Neolithic uh, type of culture. So when we saw the Minoans actually immigrated to the area from uh, what is now modern day Turkey, and it's thought that the Cycladic cultures were a mixture of people that had immigrated from Turkey and also the Greek mainland. Um, and they're also known for creating these amazing burial figurines. So there's been about um, 1,400 of these figurines found, and uh, we'll take a look at some of them. So the Cycladic Islands uh, were first inhabited by voyagers from Asia Minor, about 3000 BC. And there's this wealth of natural resources, such as gold, silver, copper, and obsidian, plus this white marble you see here. And they used obsidian as a major, which is volcanic um, stone, as a major trade source. So um, they also produce these very distinctive sculptures that were produced somewhere between 3000 to 2000, as you can see here, BCE, before the influence of the Minoan culture. But it was thought that these um, heads that are carved very simply were also painted with bright colors to create detail. So now the colors have worn off, but there's um, been many of these kinds of idols discovered. And these have Many of them are on display, so a few of them, not many, um, a sampling of them are on display at the Louvre Museum in Paris. And it was thought that they were very much appreciated by Picasso and the sculptor Henry Moore in the work that they did in their art in the early 20th century. The Cycladic figurines usually show a predominance of female figures sometimes pregnant, which suggests uh, some sort of fertility goddess. And they've been found um, both in on burial sites and outside of burial sites also. Um, and so one thing that um, is notable is they show this figurine standing, but in fact, these were made to be lying down usually across a tomb. So this was mounted to a, um, a upright you know, figure made into an upright figure later. And um, this is the type of art then that was usually showing some kind of a single link female with arms folded across the front was the typical pose. Another mysterious artifact from this early culture is these quote unquote frying pans. Although they, there's no evidence that they ever had been used for cooking about um, 200 of them, like I said, have been found so far and usually in grave sites. So it's thought there was some kind of a ceremonial or perhaps religious artifact. Um, some suggestions could be that there were some sort of a drum that they could have been used as some sort of a mirror. Um, they usually have these very decorative backs. Notice the spiraling motifs on the back. And um, they also thought if, if they tried to fill it with water or olive oil, it could also create some kind of a mirror effect. And um, again, these are another mystery that needs to be solved. <laughs> the last culture that we'll talk about today is the Mycenaean culture. And it's a, a group of people that immigrated from Northern Europe down into Southern part of the Greek peninsula. Um, and they were thought to have entered Greece from the north by around 2000 BC. And they were known as fierce warriors. So after the destruction of, um, you know, parts of the Minoan culture, it was thought that they invaded those areas and gained dominance. 
Um, they also created large palaces and decorated them with fine frescoes and relief um, patterns. And they also were using geometric and naturalistic designs. So let's take a look at the Mycenaean culture a little more thoroughly. They're called the Mycenaean culture because the, they're based around the town Mycenae, which you can see there on the Greek peninsula. Um, and this is the site of a great palace of Agamemnon. So if you've ever read Homer, the Iliad, about the Trojan War, uh, that's the king that sent his troops over to uh, recapture Helen, the most beautiful woman in the world, supposedly, and created the 10-year-long Trojan War. So the Mycenaeans were considered to be bold traders, fierce warriors, and great engineers. There's many, they built many bridges, fortified walls, and these uh, significant tombs. They had sort of a feudal system where the king was the head of the social structure, and then it went down to the warrior classes, the priestly class, the warrior class, and then the, the um, people that were working the land, similar to serfs in the Middle Ages. So again, the Mycenaeans invaded and conquered Crete. You can see the Nosos down there in about 1400 BC. And um, their, the Minoan culture had flourished for about 1600 years, but it started to wane after this, um, during this time period. So one of the significant uh, designs from the Mycenaean, Mycenaean culture is the Megaron. And this is a great room. And it was thought to have been designed around the idea of a central courtyard. So during this time period, um, in many of the cultures we've studied, as you can see, remember of the Palace of Knossos, the building was created around an open courtyard. So what they did here was they made it an internal room with a large skylight. And there would be a, a fire that would be burning 24-7, uh, like a ritual fire that would vent out through that open skylight. And um, this was surrounded by four columns and the throne would typically be on the right. So let's take another look at it. Unlike the Minoan culture that really celebrated the female and the goddesses, uh, the Mycenaean culture restricted the Megaron. It was thought for men only and it was difficult to get to this particular spot. It was uh, within the circulation pa pattern of the palace. It was in relative isolation. So it was reached only through a single door. So again, unlike the Minoans, which had very open flowing floor plan for the palace, uh, this reflects the mindset of the people being more uh, inspired by creating a sense of defense or protection for some of their sp special places like the Megaron. Palace and towns uh, were usually situated on hilltops or other protected locations. And um, again, this, uh, these palaces would have massive fortified walls surrounding the palace um, with a gate that controlled the forces coming in and out of the city, like we saw with the Babylonians. And they were, you know, of course, concerned with protection by creating structures like this. And they had a spacious interior hall called the Megara, or called Great Room, or Megaron as a singular version of that. Um, and this is, again, an interior courtyard. So usually it had some sort of a porch um, that was supported by the columns like you could see on the last slide, and then um, a vestibule that came into this center part of the room, which was filled with a circular hearth where they usually had religious rituals. Um, and again, using that fire for the ritual. And the four columns are symmetrically placed around that hearth. The type of construction used to build that protection wall around the palace and the city is what's called cyclopean, which means rough, unworked, meaning um, stones that aren't really particularly carved in a fine way, but, but that are very large are stacked on one another in what's called load-bearing construction, where the lower courses of the stone are supporting the upper courses of the stone, and they're filled without clay mortar, so just kind of loose stone filling. And this cyclopean term is um, related to the word cyclops. 
So because these stones were so huge, for example, that um, lintel stone across the opening there is estimated to be 15 feet long, um, seven feet high, or wide and three feet thick, um, that only the cyclopses, which were a brand of one-eyed giants, could have been strong enough to build these walls. It's called the Lion's Gate because you can see the two female lions on either side of this Minoan column. So interestingly, uh, that column was a stand-in for the goddess and um, the two lionesses were protecting you know, the city and, and then protecting the goddess herself. So we saw the image of the goddess with the two lions going back to the ancient Near East, remember with uh, the symbols of Inanna or the moon goddess or Ishtar um, with her two lionesses in protection, protection mode. One thing I meant to say is that um, this is approached by an engineered ramp that leads to an open courtyard that's about 49 feet by 24 feet and you have to go through that gateway. So you can see again that they're really controlling who can come in and out of the city. Um, so an invading troop can't just stream in and overcome their, um, their city easily. They need to go through this processional way similar to again the processional way we saw Babylon. This one's not quite as grand as that one, but still pretty impressive. This uh, example of Cyclopean masonry, and again, those, those big stack stones, also show what's called corbeling. So notice that arch where the courses of stone kind of um, get staggered so that they end up meeting on a point above the lintel. It's estimated that lintel spanning across the door weighs about 120 tons, just to give you a sense of scale. Um, there were nine such tombs. These are called tholos, and they're burial tombs. And there were nine of these found around Mycenae. This, um, again, this one particular one is called the Treasury of Atreus, which uh, it's built in the side of a hill, and different remains had been found there. So it's thought that um, they were built first and then later they started to be used as burial chambers and so they would just go in and lay the body down in the chamber because there's evidence of older remains kind of stacked over towards the side walls and then the, the newer remains in the middle. So these tombs were built in the side of a hill in the shape of a beehive and Remember the bee was a sacred uh, symbol to these cultures and continued to be so through the centuries. It was also thought that it was built in the side of the hill to, again, and the shape of the tholo, um, tholos was helping to resist the earth's weight. So this distinctive shape kind of helped take the pressure of the earth off the structure. And um, again, within these tombs have been found some incredible artifacts that we'll see next. This burial mask was discovered in 1876 at Mycenae by a, a German archaeologist and there's been some dispute as to whether this is a legitimate artifact but the archaeologist claimed that he had found the mask of Agamemnon. He was convinced that Homer's Iliad was indeed fact and that this because the grave was so grand had to be of that king but in fact this uh, mass predates the Trojan War by about 400 years, but it's still showing that this was probably some kind of a royal person. Uh, there were other um, warriors in the grave with weapons, and there were uh, other gold masks found as well. The custom of clothing leaders in gold is known in other cultures as too, other cultures too. Uh, but what this was created from was a single thick sheet of gold um, heated and then hammered to create these um, repose, it's called or chased dimensional effects and then using sharp tools to incise it to create the texture of the beard and the eyebrows and so forth. And um, so whether it's, you know, Agamemnon or not, it has been now authenticated as coming from that time period. Um, and it's still a spectacular artifact. 
Another incredible set of artifacts found in these tombs are the Vapio cups. This, there were two of them found in the Tholos, uh, prob possibly made by the Minoans because they have very um, Minoan look to them and Minoan themes. One cup is showing a scene of violence where they're hunting bulls and netting them. And the other cup is a quiet cup shown um, in the slide here where they're just tying the bull's leg and it was the idea of maybe sacrificing the bull to honor the gods and a symbol of fertility. So again, this was another um, tomb treasure found from the Mycenaean time period. It was a very short overview of the Mycenaean culture, but as we look at the ceramics, notice the use of the spiral, um, which was seen also with the Minoans and this somewhat simple form of the cup and simple style of painting is now in our next period we'll be talking about. The Greek period uh, will be get much more complex. So we'll be talking about that next and next class as well. As the emergence of the Greek culture um, came into fruition, there was different phases that we'll be discussing and we'll get into this next week but you can see the different time periods and phases here and uh, let's go through a few slides just to show you a preview for next class and uh, like I said we'll go into this in more detail then. We'll dive into the background and history of the Greek civilization more next class <clears throat> but this is just giving you a preview of how the artwork's going to change over time. So during this late geometric period from about 900 BCE, uh, was a time when Greek was composed of mainly city-states um, or a polis. So instead of one unified country, of course, it was just several separate city-states. The Greek alphabet was starting to be uh, used. New trade routes were established. Uh, larger temples were being built to honor patron deities. There was a rise of state religion. And this was also the time of Homer, where he wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, so there's a lot of warrior iconic um, icons in the design. And you can see that in this geometric phase of the pottery. So notice it's just done with these very um, crisp bands of register or pattern going horizontal bands going across and these kind of male figures on the pot. And uh, let's take a look at the next one. Greek pottery starts to gain complexity in both form and in the different types of shapes the pots took on and in decorative uh, application as well. So one of the key motifs that we see, you can notice the labrys shapes, that double-headed axe shape that we saw in the Minoan culture, but notice that fret pattern kind of like a labyrinth along the top. And this is the Greek key or fret, which we're going to be seeing quite a bit of throughout the class. It's inspired by the river Meander, which is actually a river that twists and turns quite a bit. Um, and it's in around Turkey. Um, and it's mentioned in Homer's Iliad. Um, and it symbols eternal flow of life and infinity. So um, this is the, the one of the icons of Greek design is that Greek key or fret that we see at the top here. In the oral lentilizing period from about 700 to 600 BCE, there was more trade going on with Asia Minor, Middle East, and Egypt and the ancient Near East, which allowed for these new artistic influences. So you start to see uh, more use of composite mythological looking creatures like griffins, like these kind of mythical animals, and this idea of um, these stiff figures like we saw in Egyptian art uh, shown in profile but um, they're also developing the black figure wear type of pottery, which we'll see coming up next week. In what's called the archaic period, um, this also shows a great Egyptian influence. So notice the kind of Egyptian pose of the figure. And these are um, koros or they're young or youths. Uh, but it is showing a more natural style, again, influenced by Egypt too. So you notice the, muscul the musculature on the body and so forth. But they also were incorporating Eastern motifs such as lotuses, composite beasts, like I said, and 
Greeks started to fan out around the Mediterranean, creating settlements from uh, around the whole Mediterranean basin from the Middle East to Sicily, North Africa, even in Spain, around the coast of uh, Marseille and um, in the coastline of Catalonia, there's different Greek uh, settlements being formed during this time. One of the interesting pieces of art from the late archaic period is the Naxian Sphinx from Delphi, which is just north of Athens. Um, this was discovered in 1861 in three pieces, but there was a large earthquake in 1870, so it was hidden again. And then it was unearthed once more in 1893. So this is carved from marble and it's resting on what's called an ionic column. We'll talk about that more next class. But this was a tribute to the Oracle of Delphi. And the Oracle was a goddess of Apollo who sat in this temple and people would go and ask her for prophecy. And in repayment or as a uh, thank you to the Oracle for them getting their, their prophecy, they would build her either a temple or a monument like this one. So we'll talk about that more next class too. You can see how Greek art changes over the centuries to the high mark of class of Greek culture, which is called the classical period, the golden age of Greece in the fifth century BC. And this was after they defeated the Persians in 479. Um, they started to really um, flourish politically and artistically and culturally. So this is an incredible bronze sculpture um, that's now found in the Museum of Antiquities in Athens, but it's about nine feet tall. And this sculpture was actually found underwater. So originally it, they thought it was the god Poseidon um, because, they, it, because he was found underwater. And he, if he would have been holding a triton, that would have been Poseidon. But because of the shape of the beard, most people think it's Zeus. So he should have been holding a lightning bolt. <laughs> so, but notice just the naturalism of the body, the mastery of bronze, which is a very hard um, material to, to sculpt in this large, or to cast in this large size of bronze. If the, if the mixture doesn't stay molten, it does a thing called caking, where it can make the figure break up or have pits or holes in it. And so just, you can see the mastery of both technology and um, you know more perception in three-dimensional effects and art uh, during this classical period. Again, we'll talk about all this more next class. So stay tuned.